Hello and welcome to episode four of the Tech Bubble. Today we peer into the future, attempting to catch a glimpse of how the workplace will look in the future. Are we heading toward a Blade Runner style future of corporate control? Hold on a minute, isn't that already happening? Or will we be living in an AI enriched society? Will we be teaching using VR simulations or wearing glasses which augment our reality? Clearly not the Google Glass though, that was a disaster. I'm your host, Ian Williamson, and joining me today we are joined by five futurists. First up, we have Ben Phipps, obviously mega popular teacher here of business studies at South Island School, and we're really delighted to have him on the show, as well as form tutor of 12K2. Welcome, Ben. How you doing? We are lucky enough to have external guests with us today also. Kevin Pereira is no stranger to South Island, having graduated from our school back in 2002. He was back this year to speak with the DLC, massive hit, and also speaking to the Year 12 TOK students as well. Kevin is currently the Managing Director covering financial services for Blue Artificial Intelligence. Wow, that sounds very cool, Kevin, although I don't actually know what it means. Welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. Kevin is joined by long-term collaborator of South Island School, Mo Koreshi. Mo is the head of learning experience for Asia at BSD here in Hong Kong. BSD have been providing our coding platform in school for several years now and even offer a BTEC course as part of the IBCP in years 12 and 13. Great to have you on the show, Mo. Glad to be here. And for the second time, back by popular demand, she puts the jazz in the show. Chloe Jazzy Lau, soon to be on the Baha'i leadership team as head of Baha'i House Council. Welcome back, Chloe. Hi, glad to be back on the show. Oh, and there's also Sam Bonnerkamp. Yeah, he's, he's here too today as well because he was bored and had nothing better to do. Only kidding. Always great to have you on the show, Sam, our former DLC head and esports expert. Welcome, Sam. Hello. Okay, to start with today, imagine if you will, dear listener, that I am Doctor Who. That's not that difficult to imagine, really, is it? More of the kind of David Tennant variety, with a little bit of a splash of Patrick Troughton, but wearing a lovely dicky bow, yeah? You may have seen me at the film awards like that before. A bit like Matt Smith, but a bit cooler. We hop into my TARDIS, which is immaculately clean, incidentally, thanks to the cordless Dyson vacuum cleaner lent to me by Ben Fitt. Thank you, Ben. And we jump forward 10 years into the future. Describe to me the technological work-related society of 2030 that we're going to find. What's 2030 going to look like in the workplace? I think it's going to be quite a different workspace. And, and I hope it is, it is such that um, we will see a lot more remote and virtual work. Uh, it may become the norm, uh, especially coming out of this COVID pandemic. Uh, we'll see people working from home, or working from co-working spaces, uh, or people could be sitting sitting at a beach or a mountaintop and, and getting their work done. I also think that new businesses and new startups are going to start evolving, emerging out of this. Uh, the other thing I potentially see is that because so many people are being potentially laid off right now and new businesses emerging, the nature of work may change. People may not seek full-time employment in one company. Rather, they may do multiple or simultaneous projects at multiple different companies. So you may have a specialist who is great at marketing or in data, and he or she may work at multiple different companies, finishing up short-term projects. This will also actually then call for varied skill sets in students right now. I totally agree with that, Mo. And just to come back to the point about working across different companies, and this is something that almost from an ethical position, I've had that challenge myself recently with um, obviously my, my, my primary job being working at South Island School, but I've had quite a few commissioned opportunities with the IBO during the last year or two. You know, in some ways, you've then got to decide how you, you plan your working day, because, you know, I think South Island have a right to expect that they have my full attention between Monday to Friday during the working week which then means that I've got to look at kind of little niche moments during the weekends where if I choose to work on a Sunday morning on a commission project, then that's obviously my choice to do that. And I do agree with you that perhaps there's going to be more of that in the future. Sam, what about you? From a student perspective, how do you see this going forward over the next 10 years? Well, a lot of people in my year now, especially now that we're thinking about our future, you know, uni or jobs or whatever, a lot of us are quite worried about what to expect, um, especially as Mo said, when with the pandemic changing a lot of things and with the general workspace environment changing all the time. It's, it's quite daunting because in the pandemic, for example, as Mo said, lots of people are losing their jobs and especially the, the younger people, the people who haven't been at the company for as long will lose their jobs first. And so 
we don't really know what to do. And especially in the fast moving industry that I plan to go into, like tech, keeping up with that is going to be a, a real challenge, I think. Over the next couple of years, maybe five, ten years, a varied skill set will definitely be uh, required, but also more like leadership skills, communication skills, and team working skills to be able to get projects off the ground faster and more efficiently. Also, I wonder there, talking about being the youngest in the company, therefore more likely to be uh, laid off. It'd be interesting to hear what Ben's got to say about that from a business perspective. But of course, you know, quite often there's that sense that you're also the cheapest. Yeah. So, so less likely to be laid off. Chloe, are you in agreement with Sam there, from, from also from a student perspective? Yeah, completely. I think we're in a really rapidly changing society now, and I definitely feel a lot more pressure to develop various different skills. So I'm in complete agreement with Sam in the sense that I'm, you know, a budding mechanical engineer, and I understand the industry that I'll be going into is very fast paced. But you know, regardless of whether you're going into a STEM field or a non-STEM field, I think as students, it's important to make sure we're equipped with future-proof skills. In the sense that we have to be wary that a lot of new jobs are going to be emerging for the first time, or existing jobs may be gaining popularity. So, for example, in the technical field, we have the data analysts, we have the software engineers, and social media specialists. And there's also going to be a lot more focus, as Sam mentioned, for jobs with people skills, so sales, marketing, and customer service. So, I definitely think that technical and social fields are expanding. And looking forward into tertiary education, I think a lot of institutions are providing new course offerings. So now more than ever, it's important to number one know that new fields are going to emerge, and number two maintain an open mind. In trying new things and perhaps even committing to less traditional careers because we cannot fully predict the progress of technology and the impact that that has on the workplace in the next few decades or so. Well, it's tough, you know, as well. I mean, Ben, I'm sure you agree with that. When you know we're sat in school and people are talking about preparing students for for jobs that don't exist yet. I mean, how, how do you do that when you don't even know what's coming up? Yeah, I mean, well, the idea behind that is that you can't because obviously you can't predict the technologies that are coming uh, accurately. So what we're trying to do, obviously, is we're trying to just get students into a space where they are flexible enough and they're sort of self-driven enough to be able to teach themselves new things and continue lifelong learning and that sort of stuff. So, yeah, you're right. It's a constant challenge. If I can bring you in there for a second, uh, Mo, I know you've got some strong thoughts on this one. Anything that you want to say in response to, to what Ben's just mentioned there? Um, how do we necessarily train for the future? We obviously don't know what the future is going to be like, but I do feel that there are certain things we know what what it'll be. Uh, we know that it's going to be a technology-driven society. We know that there's going to be new kinds of technology. We know going to be that new businesses, and we also know that the rate of evolution is going to be much much fast. So it calls for obviously rapid learning, but also rapid unlearning at times. Sometimes things which were relevant now, ten years later, they maybe are obsolete, but also um, opportunities for collaboration across time zones, across cultures, across languages. So that amount of flexibility and empathy that comes in. And and the last one, I think, because there's so many young people right now, how do you stand out? So that individual as a brand uh, will also become quite important. Very good, Mo. I knew there was a reason why I'd invited you on the show. Sam, you've got your hand up there. What I wanted to say in uh, response to Mo, I agree with you, but I also think that in a society where we have to learn and unlearn a bunch of new things and whatnot, we have to also live in a society that will facilitate that growth. So there used to be mobility for each individual person to go back to school or to um, leave their job for whatever, to be able to take risks without having to worry about the livelihood of their family or themselves at the expense of a job. What you're talking about there is lifelong learning. And, you know, I often say to some of the students that I teach that maybe doing education right now for you is not the biggest focus in your life. That you know, especially when you're in years 12 and 13, it's your choice, isn't it, to come back into the senior section. And some students find themselves that there are other things that are going on in their lives that are kind of getting in the way of, of learning at that time. And of course, why shouldn't they then you know, pick that learning back up again at a later stage in, in their lives? So there's that flexibility there. Kevin, what about in terms of the future from, from your side? Will I have an artificial intelligence version of myself? And if so, can I be Hal from 2001 A Space Odyssey? Yeah, that, that's an interesting one, right? I actually think a lot of the trends that we're going to see from the future of work are actually going to derive from business model innovation, right? Because at the end of the day, the new business models of the future will then require employees of the future to do different things. So I think it's those trends really that become one of the main drivers behind what we're going to see. So for example, if you think like autonomous vehicles, right? 
the future of autonomous vehicles could actually be rather than you own your own car or you call a Uber to pick you up, it might be that rather than pay for it, you actually sit in the car, you're shown ads, and those ads are very targeted because the system knows who you are, your demographics, it also knows your destination as well. So if you're going to the airport, they know you're a certain age, you know, they could perhaps suggest something very targeted for you. So I do think, you know, when you see business models like that change, the rides of the future may also be free, you know, and, and if we're willing to sit there and, and take those ads, then folks who develop content for those ads become much more important. So I really think, you know, business model innovation is going to drive what we will see that's demanded from the workforce. Ben, um, I think, you know, if we're talking about 10 years time, you should also not forget that I think it's largely going to depend on about where in the world you are. Because not all countries, not all cities, not all regions of countries are going to have the same opportunities to develop things like this. So, you know, Kevin was talking about self-driving cars, which is clearly a super exciting technology. And yeah, it's definitely going to be, you know, have a huge uptake in places like Europe and the States and in China. But there's a lot of places in the world where that is probably a lot more than 10 years off working because of the, you know, the infrastructure there. You know, whether that's like their 5G technologies or even just their road networks. So, you know, if you think about it from an economic lens, the rich world is going to develop at a much faster rate, I would imagine, I'm guessing, than the poor areas of the world. The slums of Kibera are going to be experiencing the tech boom in a very different way as to Shanghai, as to London, as to, you know, as to um, Seattle, for example. Have any of you seen uh, the third season of Westworld, by the way, and the self-driving cars in there? This is, this is all sounding very Westworld season three. That's what I'm saying at the moment. <laughs> Somebody had their hand up there. Was there somebody want to come back? So Kevin and then uh, Sam. Yeah, I definitely echo Ben's point that it's going to be different in different places. But I had a chance to work in Myanmar before my current role. And actually in Myanmar, we noticed that there was a technological leap. So people were going from no internet to 5G straight away, which I think you know then will indicate that path of developed world versus developing, it might not necessarily follow those trends. I agree that it'll follow based on the technology infrastructure, but I think it's important to keep in mind that certain markets are going to do some technology leapfrogs. And I think that's actually going to really help that business model innovation. So, you know, in 10 years from now, I could see Internet in Myanmar being better than Internet in Hong Kong. And a lot of people would never believe that. But legacy infrastructure makes these types of things difficult sometimes. Interesting. Sam? I've got a couple of things to mention here. First, I want to respond to um, the thing about whole autonomous cars. And there's this thing in sci-fi called AMFM. AM stands for actual machines, FM stands for freaking magic. So an example of FM would be, for example, Elon Musk's Hyperloop, where it's a great idea on paper and, and, and really cool and futuristic, but not really feasible in the near future. And I think things that are crazy um, futuristic, like uh, autonomous cars or, like you mentioned, a HAL version of yourself, are just not going to happen in the near future. And I think other developments are going to happen before that. As you said, internet in Myanmar or, or whatever, something like that, um, globalization, internationalization. So I think it's just important to mention when we're talking about the future. I wonder, I mean, I, I'm not entirely sure whether I think that autonomous cars are, are way into the future. I think that they may well be here sooner than, than you think, perhaps. If you heard some very strange creaking noises a few minutes ago, by the way, that was because I was just putting the TARDIS into gear. We're now going back to 2020 after that little visit to 2030. So let me reverse the question now. We talked a lot over the last few weeks on the show about what we should keep from the online learning phase when we eventually do return to school, which will hopefully be very soon. As a more long-term vision of this same idea, what kind of skills do you think over the next decade will not change? We'll, we'll need to retain those going forward into the workplace. Chloe, let's start with you. Yeah, I'd say um, skills like human connection and empathy would be the obvious ones because those are ones that cannot be automated. So that, you know, brings us into the field of teaching in the sense that can AI really replace teachers? And I think the answer to that is no, because teaching is such a complex profession and I feel like teachers have to have such a deep personal connection with their students in order to truly understand the pace that they're learning at, which cannot fully be automated. So personally, I can't see a future in which robots will be able to carry out human qualities like genuine empathy. I, I've read that it is possible in the distant future for you know AI implementation into the classrooms. 
but instead of replacing teachers or displacing teachers from the workforce per se, AI and technology would probably be used in the near future to make their work more effective, in the sense that there might be algorithms that will predict what students struggle with, and then which makes you know lesson work and preparation work a lot easier to do uh, than it is now. Um, so you know, with that increased flexibility, I think teachers might step into the role of coaching with a lot of personalized data available from their students. There's a lot more support that teachers can give to individual students to make them feel more included and valued in a classroom environment. Um, so Mr. Phipps, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this as a teacher yourself. What do you think AI is going to change in terms of the educational industry or your occupation right now? Well, I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard because I'm, I'm, I'm certainly no AI expert. Um, I guess it would just give me access to better and better and better information. I mean, even remember when I first started teaching, the access to the information that we had is it was so much less than it is now. Um, and that's only made our predictions more accurate, you know, our, our teaching styles more, more effective, et cetera, et cetera. So I guess it's just going to be able to enhance what I do. In the long run, do I think teachers will be replaced totally? Um, yeah, pr- probably. Yeah, I th- you know, I think, you know, if you give it 100 years or something, maybe 50 or, or whatever, you know, uh, eventually there's going to be convincing enough AI to be able to certainly teach basic subjects um, as well as or if not better than, than a, you know, than a human. De- yeah, definitely better than a human. So, yeah, it, it has multiple effects. I'm just relieved. That means it's probably going to see me through my career. Although I was wondering whether it's possible to then get some cyborg, you know, upgrades, maybe sort of running on sports there or whatever, in maybe four or five seconds in the cyborg race rather than the main one. <laughs> that could be a whole new area there. I'll have to maybe speak to the P department about that. Strangely enough, we do have an AI expert with us. So Kevin, I'd be really interested to get your take on this. Yeah, sure. And, and you know, I'm actually happy to, to share my experience of teaching as well. So I teach over at uh, HKU and HKUST here in Hong Kong, uh, and I teach an AI course to their MBAs. And I think the running joke, whenever I talk about a certain AI technology, the kids, I think, try to find a way to say, can we use this to replace the AI professor? Right. And that constantly is the joke that they always have. And, you know, my sense, uh, and I think perhaps with the recent situation that we've seen, a lot of the students tell me that now when I do my lectures over Zoom, they prefer the in-person, right? And I think that, in essence, says that, you know, that in-person, that real touch that teachers have, I think actually counts. And I think now we've actually been able to see that, right? So I think uh, from a teaching perspective, I, I still feel there are a lot of in-person, non-AI things that are valuable for students. But if we think about this from a skill set perspective, you know, just echo a lot of what Chloe said. And I think it's about really the human to human interaction component, right? That's really the hardest thing for AI to automate. Us as human beings, we're very complex emotionally. And so those human to human interaction pieces are very, very difficult to replicate. I think the one other skill perhaps not mentioned that I'd like to talk about is also storytelling, right? Because storytelling is about being persuasive, whether it's sales skills, whether it's convincing somebody to go help you out with something, that's a very important skill set. Right? And I think that's something that's very, very difficult to automate. And as a private banker, you know, I, I met a lot of CEOs because those are many of our clients. And I always ask myself, why are these guys so successful? Like, what makes them different? And I think the common theme that I always saw was actually EQ. You know, it was never that they were technically more gifted or they could do math faster than anybody else, but it was that storytelling skill, that empathy skill, all those EQ pieces of them were really, really good. So I, I think those are hard to automate. And I think those are things we should try to work on, whether it's personal development, whether it's career, and irrespective of what age you're at. Mo? I definitely echo Kevin and and Chloe's sentiments here. I I would personally like teachers to be physically present in in classrooms even a thousand years from now, because I I think a lot of my personal development has happened because of that human-to-human connection. I'd like to talk a little bit more about the aspect of creativity also. Uh, With all of these advancements and changes in the world, what is also going to create is a range of new problems. And to solve these new problems, which we don't even know uh, will exist and what kind they are, that human creativity, uh, innovation is going to be important. And I think AI will play the role of an assistant and help us figure out what those issues are. It may not necessarily solve it. It would still be humans working together with, with AI uh, to solve that. 
And going back to Chloe's point of teachers being a facilitator or, or a coach, uh, interestingly, um, I began seeing that almost two, three years ago in the edtech space, even before that. But it's just uh, accelerated in the last three months. I've been working with about 100 teachers in 14 different countries, and almost all of them are not teaching lessons real time. Uh, so they may be pre-recording something or they may be giving students the assignment and they're flipping it around. They're saying, okay, you know what? You learn on your own. You've got these deadlines. And whenever you have questions, we'll all uh, sit together and we'll solve them together. So the teacher is not teaching so much. The students are learning on their own. And then the teacher is helping them problem solve uh, or work together. Uh, and, and I think that's an excellent role that also answers you know, Sam's point of lifelong learning. Uh, you may have a learning coach that you may hire for 10 years, maybe. Good. Because I've still got a job out there then, Mo. That's what you're basically saying to me, isn't it? Ben, wouldn't you agree? I mean, the economy needs teachers, though, doesn't it? I mean, you know, I've said before that in some ways, teaching is almost like a kind of, you know, like the most best paid form of babysitting in the world, where if people want to go out to work, they want to send their kids out where they're going to learn things. The, the role of the teacher in society surely is still going to be needed going forward, isn't it? I mean, I, I completely agree with the point, incidentally, about AI kind of, you know, as a conduit, as a supporting mechanism. And we're already starting to see that happening in the poorer countries that Ben was talking about earlier on. Smart classrooms, for instance, in China. Ben, what, what, what do you think in terms of the, the economic side of this? Yeah, well, actually, you know, I hadn't actually considered that. Um, you're right, parents do need somewhere to park the kids, don't they? Um, <laughs> yeah, I'm guessing in that respect, yeah. There's always going to be a role for like a central hub for children to gather at. As long as parents don't start working at home en masse, I mean, you know, we talked earlier about, you know, this whole thing is, is demonstrating to everybody, you know, a large percentage of the world's population, that we have a lot more capacity to work at home than we ever have had before. Having said that, I don't have young children like yourself. Uh, and I'm imagining that it's uh, it's quite tricky to have kids at home whilst working at home, yeah? I'm very lucky. My son's very independent, I've got to say. But you're absolutely right. I think for many teachers, that's an incredibly difficult balancing act. Uh, and I know that that's the case, having you know, spoken to many. So I, I agree with you. If, uh, if there is a, a more of a movement towards working from home, that in itself, of course, has a ripple effect as well. Chloe, I'm going to run with the point that you made there because there were several responses to it. So, you know, you, you were talking about this possible transition of teachers into coaches, you know, as we maybe progress through the next decade or so. And I think from, from what Ben and Mo have already said there, this is kind of already starting to happen. We're, we're moving towards a pedagogy which involves inquiry-based learning. Mo, to go back to you, in terms of BSD, what, what do you think, first of all, is that, that there is actual evidence that this is happening right now in, in, in your work? Uh, the, the evidence is in, in the last three months where teachers have not been teaching uh, real-time lessons. There are a few teachers I know who are going on to Zoom or Skype or some video conferencing tool and teaching real-time lessons. What happened, interestingly, at least in Asia, is when the pandemic emerged, it was Chinese New Year time. So a lot of people were still traveling and many of them didn't get an opportunity to come back to their homes. So they stay put for one or two months in their holiday location or in their grandparents' homes, etc. So what happened because of that was teachers were not able to run real-time lessons either because of connectivity issues or because of time differences. So they said, OK, let's have asynchronous learning. Uh, we'll give students some deadline. We'll give all of the materials and they will learn on their own. So, so they were not teaching per se. They were not lecturing per se. The students were learning on their own. Maybe they were going above and beyond the materials provided. So there would be a dedicated time where all students would come together with the teacher and the teacher would answer the questions. In math or programming lessons, all of their debugging or problem solving would happen in real time, but the concept building and learning would happen on their own. So that's one big evidence of this happening already. I guess that has to go hand in hand still with the didactic at BSD, though. I mean, for many of your teachers, coaches, whatever we want to call them, when they're dealing with coding, for instance, they're more likely to be literally going through step by step and therefore still needing to go through that didactic process. So that, that's still in there, isn't it? I think in, in one form or another. Definitely. Also, actually brings an interesting question. And Ian, that's for yourself and, and Ben, is as these models emerge and as technology transforms schools and teaching, there will be a range of new skills that teachers will have to develop and gain. So what would be teacher survival skills in 2030? This is just chaos, listeners, at the moment. First of all, <laughs> Chloe poses her own question, usurping my position as the host of the show. Now, Mo, I don't know where this is all going to. Just stay with us, listeners. Ben, do you want to start with that one? 
Well, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, I'm a bit of a, a caveman when it comes to my teaching. I'm very much a chalk and talk kind of guy. So, you know, the idea for me of, of developing all these new skills for the next 10 years is, is quite scary. However, what I well, I'll answer to this is that when I bring new technologies, new, new techniques and stuff in the classroom, it's often come from things that I'm using in my personal life first. So, for example, you know, like I, I use a lot of my iPad and my Apple Pencil now, and I, I bought them before all of this stuff, you know, to, to, to entertain me. And as I became more and more comfortable with it, you know, I, I brought that into my teaching and into my teaching practice. So I think that's that's likely, you know, teachers are busy, you know, they're all different age ranges, they're not necessarily completely comfortable with technology. So I think the, yeah, the main driver of bringing new technologies into class is going to be how familiar they are with them outside the classroom first. And I think that's what a lot of teachers already do. I mean, quite often the people who are really into digital technologies as tools, they've been experimenting outside of school, they're excited about something and they want to bring it in and hope that students learn from it. In answer to your question, Mo, I would say that something that's really important for me is maintaining the ability to leave your pride at the door a little bit when it comes to education over the next 10 years. I think the facilitator at the front of the room who thinks that they know everything is a fool, really, because, you know, it's great to have that content and subject knowledge. And I totally agree with Ben. There are times and places where that didactic knowledge is something that I think that the kids are thirsty for. They want somebody to stand in front of them who really knows and is passionate about their subject and who can give them some information and something to kind of hold on to. Therefore, I don't think inquiry-based learning, you know, as a model needs to be used all the time. It's a tool like any other to be used. But I think that it's okay as well to say you don't know. As, as a digital literacy coordinator, I cannot possibly know everything about digital literacy and all of the different software programs that are out there. And it's brilliant. Even some of my younger students, they're far better at using Photoshop than me. And I had two or three of them then teaching the rest of the class how to do some of the more sophisticated elements of Photoshop in lessons. So I guess my answer to you there, Mo, is, is learning to let go and use the expertise that's in the room ar around you. Sam, what are your thoughts there from a year 13 perspective? Um, I'm approaching this with less of a year 13 perspective and more of my experience teaching the coding club at school. And um, how you mentioned that the students long for somebody at the front who knows what they're talking about. In my lessons, I essentially try to replace that person with Google or Stack Overflow or something, where I would encourage the students to go and figure it out themselves from this vast array of knowledge that we have on the internet. And it also ties into the way you said about you know students helping students and learning to let go is um, practically it allows you to to help m many more students at once if you can just say oh you know Google that or whatever. You can manage a lot more students at once, of course, but also it really cements the knowledge in the students if they themselves were the ones who had to search it up and implement the solution and whatnot. And so I think in terms of survival skills in 2030 for teachers, using resources like the internet would be a very easy way to do what you guys were talking about. It boils down to learning to teach yourself, doesn't it? Uh, exactly. Although I would argue that having you in the room, Sam, is fantastic, that you do answer questions, you do show them literally in a didactic way how to walk through steps, yeah. Yeah. rather than them asking me a question and being faced by somebody with a rather bemused looking impression on their face. Chloe? Yeah, I just wanted to add that in terms of skills with teachers, I think there's a large potential for retraining programs and AI being used to even retrain some of these uh, not even teachers, but just workers in general that might not have the skills that we might need in a decade or so. So there is a large amount of data available to basically optimize retraining programs. And then you'll get suitable content recommended to you based on your strengths, weaknesses and learning preferences that, you know, makes the learning experience more enjoyable and makes the learning curves and the skills we'll need in a decade a lot easier. So I think as opposed to, you know, fearing AI as something that will take away your job. I think it could even be a tool to help teachers or otherwise be able to develop these new skills in a more effective manner. That's a perfect segue actually, Chloe, because until now we've sort of skirted around a focus that maybe some of our listeners would have expected us to address, and that's of course ethics. We're well used to visions of the future via science fiction. I was joking about, you know, sort of cyborgs earlier on. We've seen the Terminator films or the Matrix films or whatever. Skynet hasn't happened yet, has it? At least I don't think it has. I haven't met John Connor anyway. <laughs> so where do you feel there may be a danger of crossing ethical line there in the workplace of the future? Sam, what do you think? Where, where do you think that might happen? I've got very strong opinions on this. Well, I think there, there are other questions that we should be asking first in order to answer this question. So for starters, uh, do we have to AIify everything? 
Mr. Phibbs earlier said that AI will eventually take over teaching. And I think that's true. I, th I think we can extend that and say AI will eventually be able to take over any job. But do we want that to happen? Do we want AI to take over most of our daily lives? Do we want to replace the teachers or, or taxi drivers or whatever with AI? Do we actually want that? Because sure, AI creates more jobs, but at the end of the day, you know, how, how marketable is a 45 year old taxi driver with basic HTML? No, not really. So I think it's also a matter of how far do we go before we end up AI-ifying too much and going overboard. A lot of people are trying to AI-ify a lot of parts of life, as you mentioned earlier in China, where the students are, you know, being monitored and whatnot. And I think it opens some real privacy concerns for the average citizen who is constantly being monitored and watched to add to some data set. And sure, all of us might have good intentions, but society kind of driven by the profit motive I can only imagine what kind of things might happen with that data if it falls, you know, into somebody who doesn't have a particularly good moral code. No. Yeah, I do echo um, Sam's concerns here, is that one, should there be an AI for everything? So should we have some sort of a universal AI or individual specific AIs? But the other one is generally as a society, as a global society, we have built some universal laws and, and rights. And when it comes to the world of tech, that doesn't seem to have been created and agreed upon. And I think that would be one good step is uh, like in the world of science fiction, you had um, Isaac Asimov with the three laws of robotics. Could we have some laws of AI where we say this is the line we agree not to cross? And there have been some classic debates in the last few years where you've got the likes of Jack Ma and Mark Zuckerberg and Elon Musk taking different sides of AI. They are bullish on AI, but they do have certain uh, fears ar around it. I think that would be great if, if we have certain rules and regulations on it. Generally, what we've seen is the world of laws is always trying to play catch up with technology, um, which generally doesn't help innovation. It tends to stifle it. But is this something you're teaching about in, in your lessons? Do you engage with issues of an ethical we nature? We do talk about ethics. I mean, it's a minefield, isn't it, with the AI and ethics? Because, you know, everybody's right here. It poses huge um, ethical dilemmas, quite frankly. But I think Sam kind of hit the nail on the head. You know, in a capitalist system where cost trumps basically everything, there is going to be a drive towards AI ifying, as I said, uh, basically everything, you know. And going back to the self-driving cars earlier, you know, a huge, huge, huge number of the world's workforce is employed as a driver, whether that's, you know, taxi drivers, bus drivers, whatever, yeah. If you make all those people out redundant with a relatively simple, you know, technological solution, I don't think the world's really worked out yet what to do with those people. Mm -hmm. um, and often, you know, taxi drivers, etc., bus drivers, they're not particularly well trained for anything else. So these are these are huge challenges. And I don't think there's going to be an agreement amongst countries that's going to stop that happening within the next 20 years. Definitely not. Kevin, if I go to you and then maybe we can finish this little segment off with Sam. Sure, yeah. I mean, I think related to this, right, we've actually had quite a few governments come to us and, and talk about this prospect of, of larger unemployment. And I think what it's going to mean is that social systems are going to have to change. There's a lot of concepts, you know, that society is thinking about, like universal basic income, for specifically, you know, that 40-year-old taxi driver who can't be retrained or reskilled. Because I think the consensus view is if they ultimately can't do anything, there's going to be social unrest, right? I mean, you'll see income inequality, you'll see a lot of kind of negative aspects of society. So I, I think that's going to be something that governments in the future are going to have to think about. And I also think that different countries will come up with different systems because there's a cultural piece there too, right? The view and equality in a place like Scandinavia will be much more accepting. You have a house, I have a house, kumbaya, let's have a barbecue in the middle. But in a place like a Hong Kong, a Singapore, or New York, it's not about you and me having the same house. It's me having a bigger house than you, right? And a lot of people take that and they make that part of their self-worth computation. And so I think, you know, those cultural pieces will actually define a lot of the social systems that are ultimately going to come and, and, and deal with some of that stuff. So I, I think that's part of it. That's a great response. Very, I think, thought provoking for you know, many of the listeners as well. Sam? Yeah, one thing I also wanted to mention is that there is, a, as Mr. Fripp said, a problem between, you know, this progress and leaving people behind. But then do we really need progress like this this fast? Sure, you know, the, the, the thing you're talking about with AI is, is very cool, but we've actually got other problems that we have to solve first, the climate crisis and whatnot and, and so on and so forth. 
So I think that this kind of technological progress does not need to come extremely fast. It can be slow and steady just to make sure that every single step along the way is still morally okay for you know, whatever that means. Seems it's like you've okay got a, again. You, you've, got a, you've got a question there and it's still okay as well, Sam. Yeah. <laughs> See if we can still get that sent to the board. You never know. <laughs> Let's come across to you in response to that. Yeah. And you know, I think just a caveat, when we talk about AI defying everything, you know, I think something to keep in mind is that when you have an AI that's coming to replace a job or to do a task, right? There's two parts to that. The one is capability, right? So can the AI actually do it? And I think that's one aspect of it. But a second often underestimated factor there is how much do people trust it? So think about in the case where you have a situation where you ask somebody, would you ever be on a uh, airplane with no human pilot? And I think most people will actually say no, right? But when you ask them that, they never think, has the pilot had a couple of glasses of wine before the flight? Has the pilot had an argument with their significant other? Like That's never a consideration, right? And I think what that means is that people, for certain aspects, still feel that I need both the AI and the human being there because I don't trust the AI, okay? So I think when we think about this kind of AI taking over stuff, I think important for all the listeners to keep in mind, we need both trust and capability. And I think if we don't have both of them together, then I think that process becomes a lot slower, like what Sam was saying. So I think it's just something to kind of consider going forward. Sam, let me bring you back in again in response to Chloe. So I'm sure. going to get you on to Chloe's point at this stage. Chloe, you strike me as having actually quite an optimistic view from what you said earlier on about the future of AI and other things. We seem to have learned a new term today, by the way, everyone, AI-ifying, which I've never heard before, <laughs> but it seems to be you know, in vogue now. So going back to those ethical questions, what would be your take? Do you think that you know, maybe we've got this sort of media representation that there's almost like these kind of negative connotations almost attached to AI, you know, in terms of our trust levels of it? What do you think going forward? Yeah, I'd say I completely agree with Kevin's point, but I just wanted to add that in the past when new innovations come, I feel like we always have a sense of resentment to the new. We're always thinking, okay, this is going to completely damage our lives. This is going to completely change our lives. The technological boom is going to allow us to completely disregard human connection. I think that's a really common thought when it comes to innovation. And I think I do want to dispel that thought in the sense that Maybe, maybe less tech-based, but Airbnb. Would you ever live in an apartment that might be someone else's or you're not too secure or safe about? Like, people have gotten used to that idea. People have gotten used to new innovations. And then slowly, they've allowed it to enter their lives as something they're used to. So I think that might actually be the take on AI in the sense that these new innovations might shock you. They might cause you to worry about how much this is overstepping the border. And obviously, by all means I'm not saying that it's okay for AI to step across the border because we do need to define some borders in terms of policy and regulation but I also think that we kind of are facing a period of mindset shifting in terms of being more receptive to these new ideas that will ultimately change our lives whether for the better or worse um, and I also just wanted to touch on the fact that AI will allow accelerated innovation in a lot of specific fields like medicine that will save a lot of lives so medical AI companies you know they're starting to combine computer vision machine learning neural networks to reveal new drug candidates and basically speed up the pace of finding treatments and this is not only limited to the medical industry but a lot of various different industries where we're finding new ways to solve problems as a result of technology. And I think this is not a complete blanket fix for all our problems right now, but I think this will allow us to take a step back and see a different perspective and see, you know, maybe technology can help us solve some of these really pressing problems that we have in society now. And I guess it's going to boil down to, does it make our lives easier? Then the shock will very quickly subside to it when we think, actually, this is a damn sight easier than it was before. And the other thing, of course, is whether it's cheap, you know, which is always going to be a factor there. Okay, so just expanding on that, if we look at things on a slightly wider level, and if we run with that sort of optimistic view that you were just discussing there, Chloe, think on a more aspirational level about human race going forward. You know, how can technology help us take sort of leaps and bounds forward as a species, not just over the next 10 years, but over the next 100 years, the next 200 years? Uh, Mo, if we can maybe start with you. 
Yeah, definitely. Um, when it comes to the world of tech... Um... Generally, very optimistic, maybe slightly idealistic and quite bullish about it. Like, I do have genuine concerns about certain things, but I think it does catapult us forward. Um, and I think we are at a moment where we should be optimistic and we should aspire for bigger, better things. So as an example, like think of the world of science fiction in the 1920s, 30s, all the way until the 60s and 70s. Uh, we were talking about being interplanetary. We were talking about flying cars and being able to print your food. We, we spoke about Space Odyssey here. It alludes to a base on the moon and it shows something like an iPad and a stylus. So I would like to believe that by 2030, maybe we've had our first manned mission to Mars. Maybe we've got better and efficient food systems. Um, that's better food storage, better distribution, maybe better production. Uh, maybe we could, you can 3D print food. As Chloe mentioned, can we have better diagnostics? Uh, it could be better travel. As Kevin mentioned, uh, maybe many countries have tested and implemented universal basic income. Uh, that could open up more avenues because maybe now people don't have to work just to get their daily meal. And they work when they find something really, really interesting. And then you may start more creativity and art emerging because now people have time to focus on those aspects. So do we see more entertainment, more art emerge out of that? I found myself doing that in, during the last three months is um, I'm not traveling to work. So I'm saving an average of two, two and a half hours a day and then various different things. So I'm cooking all my meals. Uh, we've got a little uh, balcony herb garden, which never happened before. So these things are emerging. I think uh, we can be extremely bullish about that aspect. I often wonder, is it just me? A manned mission to Mars. Shouldn't that be sponsored by the Mars Confectionery Company? There you go, Ben. That's your next lesson. The synergy in that one, surely. <laughs> Kevin, what do you think over the next century or so? I'm personally really excited and I could talk for hours on this, but let me, let me go for two points, right? So first one, you know, in terms of our species over the next century, I think with healthcare, right, there's a move with AI to make healthcare preventative rather than reactive. So basically, AI starts looking at scans of you and starts predicting in 10 years, what are you going to have? And therefore, what should you do now to avoid those problems, right? And if we can truly do that well, I mean, some of the, the predictions I've seen, our life expectancy goes from, you know, 80 odd to even 100, 110, right? And that's average. So not only is it about the species over the next century, that we might be around for a lot longer, right, because of AI. So that's one area that I'm excited about. And then I think secondly, from a future of work perspective, you know, I think when you have AI come in, I think you will also see a lot of jobs that we can't even conceptualize yet. You know, back in the day when we didn't have smartphones, no one knew what an app developer was, right? But today, a big chunk of the world is in app development. And tomorrow, when we see some of these new business model innovations, I really think that's going to create a lot of jobs we haven't conceptualized. And so a lot of things we've talked about today, you know, continuous skill development, looking at things that are related to human to human interaction. I mean, I think it's really important that we keep working on those as human beings to stay relevant so that whatever jobs come in, whatever future conceptualized jobs happen, you know, we'll be ready for them. And I think that's a very important aspect for all of humanity to, to really embrace. It always fascinates me this idea of, you know, human life extending as well and what kind of issues that in itself may well bring. We're able to extend lives for another 50 years and people are living until 150, not just in terms of population growth. That doesn't go in tandem, of course, with an, an increase in, in world population, um, but also as to whether the human brain until now has not really been designed, has it, to live for 150 years? People are going to start going crazy as you know, the older that they live. Who, who knows? Ben, any thoughts from, from your perspective there? Um, what, over the over the future of humanity. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I think I'm probably a bit more of a pessimist than the, um, the two previous speakers. I think a lot of technology is going to have to be focused around solving the climate crisis. You know, for instance, uh, me and me and Mr. Metcalf actually were talking the other day about the future of travel. And we were sort of discussing whether we think people will travel as much uh, in the future as they do now. You know, have we hit peak travel yet? We're not sure. Probably not. But I imagine in the next 20 years, uh, maybe 30 years, 50 years, however, you know, the climate issue goes, people are going to have to travel less. So things like VR, maybe visiting, you know, obviously I live in a different continent to my mum. You know, maybe uh, rather than me taking my, my usual continental flights to go and see my mum you know, a couple of times every year or whatever, Maybe in the future, these things are going to be done purely in a virtual space through VR and whatnot. You know, I'm sure the technology will move in you know, amazing ways. 
uh, but anything to basically enable the human, uh, human race to continue and the planet to sustain us. I think that's going to be an important thing to think about. We had Zach Diakadis in school uh, earlier on this year who, you know, works in VR, speaking about many of the same things, uh, Ben, you know, the opportunities for VR. And apparently VR headsets have been on the increase during this uh, whole kind of, you know, lockdown phase. Uh, Chloe. I just wanted to add to Mo's point in terms of art and music, I think, especially when AI starts to infiltrate, quote unquote, our lives a bit more. As a species, we will look to more expressive forms of communication, I think, and that's going to be found in art and music and all the things that, you know, we're kind of brushing under the carpet and disregarding and fixating on technology right now. I think those will start to emerge as technology kind of gets put into our daily lives even more. So I think there is a lot of potential in terms of us being able to express ourselves through um, art. Um, Sam, did you have a response to that for Chloe? Actually, I have a response to Mr. Phibbs. I'm also a pessimist in this regard. I somehow don't feel that also to the climate crisis that we're gonna end up in some utopian post-scarcity future thanks to technology and i i'd say that i spend a lot of my time when i think about technology worrying about its negative outcomes um when it's relation to to privacy and and the profit motive and, and all that stuff actually i will respond to chloe as you said earlier with airbnb how airbnb is an example of how we've gotten accustomed to technology and how that is a staple of how how the rest of it's going to work and i think that's not a very good way in my opinion, to get accustomed to technology, because Airbnb, in my, I don't really like the company <laughs> for its, uh, you know, its issues with uh, stealing jobs away from hotels and uninsured, you know, the, the gig economy kind of thing. I think that kind of getting accustomed to technology in the future is a little bit sketchy, and so I think operating under this profit motive, as we said with with companies like this, and back to what Kevin said about trust. I think in a situation now, like with Airbnb and like with a profit motive, we establishing trust with AI and, and uh, technology in the future will be significantly harder than if it's maybe something from a trusted source like the government or something like that. Chloe and, and Sam have both already know that we like to finish the show with some takeaways. So my question for you all is, is this. Consider, you know, the year seven students listening to the show. What practical tips should we be giving students to help prepare themselves for a future which we don't even know what that's going to be? And certainly very difficult to predict. So I'm glad you're going to be answering this one and not me. <laughs> Kevin, can we start with you? Sure. I think the most important thing for students today is really concentrate on those human to human interaction skills right? Empathy, creativity, trust building, a lot of stuff that we've talked about. I think those are very, very important. I think also just keep in mind what are the new potential business models that are coming out and how you can get involved in them. So I think that's one. I think number two, getting on the AI side, right? I think learning something like intro programming is a really smart idea. Part of why that is, you may not basically become a programmer tomorrow, but your communication with more technical people will get better. And I think in future, we're going to see a lot of jobs that have some element of what I like to call business translators, right? So that's the folks who sit between the AI scientists and the business decision makers. And I think if you can understand enough about the technology and also be able to understand the business elements of it, it's a very, very good place to be. And so I think a lot of business students and, and sort of non-technical folks, they're going to see AI come in. They're going to have to be able to deal with it. So I think that's, uh, that's going to be a very key job function uh, going forward. To get the year sevens, I'm recording that. I'm ready with that, okay? Uh, Mo? Uh, I do, do agree with Kevin on these spots, and uh, it's literally been something I've been doing for the last seven to eight years at BSD, and before that with my previous businesses, and when I was a teacher myself. So introduction to tech in any form. To all the young listeners, using tech, so using your iPad or your console, uh, or using a specific app is very different from understanding how it was created and how it works. So go under the surface and figure out how it was built, what goes into the hardware and the electronics, what goes under the hood in terms of code. Your career, as Kevin mentioned, may not be a programmer. That's completely okay. You may want to be a doctor, you may want to be a lawyer or a sportsman. Irrespective of that, your life is going to be impacted by tech. What may happen is that you may innovate and create a tool or an app for uh, the legal world or for the medical world. And this knowledge of technology will help you come up with a better tool for that specific field. I, I really feel that this merging of sectors becomes important. One is that. Um, the other thing is don't learn in silos. 
So don't say I want to focus only on math or only on science or only on language. The real world is a multidisciplinary. So start looking at all of that. And the other one would be, I think this is the time, maybe until your early 20s, to explore and do a variety of different things. Yeah, which, which if I was to go back 10 years in my life, I would want to do that is explore a lot more. Travel may or may not happen. That could be one. Uh, but the others try various different things. And then once you figure out that you have some skills for that and you really enjoy it, go in depth um, into that. Great tips. And many of those points there about thinking about going beyond just the technology in your hand, but how it actually works. We're going to have an episode on computer science coming up in a few weeks' time. Um, we're going to have Tom Lee on the show and a few others. So nice segue there, Mo. Ben? Yeah, tips for so year seven specifically, yeah? Yeah, just the future. I mean, some of the younger students perhaps in school, they're thinking, how, how do we navigate this world over the next 10 years? There's so many things that we've talked about today. Well, if you had to come up with, you know, one or two, what, what would, would be your kind of key, key recommendations? I mean, I, I guess I would advise our younger students to be as entrepreneurial as possible with the latest popular apps and, and software that, that they have access to. You know, I, I still sort of remember being young, you know, I'm 33 now, but I feel so far removed and so far out of understanding how people are making money off things like TikTok and their Instagram pages and all that sort of stuff. It's passed me by and it baffles me now. So I think, you know, I, I always tell, you know, my students to try and use these things just to be as you know, entrepreneurial as possible. You know, release a rap track and put it on YouTube, you know, do it because you've got to strike while the iron's hot. You know, these things pass you by really quickly. I'm, I'm out of the loop. Spoken <laughs> <laughs> like a true business teacher. Which, uh, <laughs> If you, you deconstruct what, you know, Mr. Phipps has said there, year sevens, it means do business, I think, is what he's basically saying there, yeah? Definitely. Um, Chloe and then Sam to finish us off. Chloe. Yeah, I'd say uh, be proactive. So really try to immerse some research on your own to learn about the AI fields that you're interested in. And I think when you're first starting out, focus on the breadth of the material first and also see what method of self-learning works for you. So I think that goes back to Sam's original point of being a lifelong learner in the sense that you'll always go to have to learn and I think as a year seven it's a really good period of time to figure out what works for you in terms of learning so whether that's explanatory videos on YouTube whether that's articles on medium and if you want to go a step beyond that look for mentors that work in the particular field of AI that you've been exploring and you know just reach out to them ask them any questions you might have and you never know this might open up opportunities like internships apprenticeships and shadowing opportunities that can kind of solidify or even tell you that okay this is the field for me or this is not something I would want to do for the rest of my life so I think honestly Honestly, in year seven, it's it's really about exploring and learning how to learn. And it's incredible, isn't it, how generous people are. There are many experts out there in the field. I mean, I use Twitter, which unfortunately wouldn't be available you know, to our year seven because of you know, age restrictions. But the number of experts in the field of film and media, in digital literacies, etc., who give freely of their work online is, is astonishing. Sam, we're going to finish off with you. What would be your recommendations? Similar to what Chloe said, I think you guys should just get interested in something, whatever it is. We've got time now at home, you have much more time to do something, you know. Find a community that's interesting, find maybe whether that be programming or whether that be like knitting or art or whatever. Find a community and get interested and um, just immerse yourself in that uh, community. Thanks, Sam. I'm going to just sort of finish off by mentioning that I heard recently the idea of billionaires. Yeah, When you think of billionaires, you know, I'm sure Mr. Fix, when he talks about that in, in business, discusses the idea of earning a billion dollars to, to get that kind of status. But what about the idea of being a billionaire where you've designed an app, uh, you've come up with some new technological solution, and your aspiration of the future is to affect a billion people's lives in a positive way? That would truly be an, a, a remarkable aspiration to go for, perhaps. That is the end of our fourth show, probably our longest show by quite some way, actually. Where has the time gone? Hopefully, by the time we make the next one, we'll be back in school. We shall see. I'd like to thank my five guests today for their candid views, and we hope that you enjoyed listening to us considering the future of work. Episode five is coming soon, and we'll focus on fake news. No, that's not an example of fake news, Year 7, but rather we'll be debating the phenomenon that is fake news. Sam and Chloe will be back with me to discuss this rather juicy topic, and it's going to be alongside Eric Wishart from the AFP and Mary Hoy, another one of our uh, alumni from Quartz. Can't wait for that one. If you've got any thoughts, questions, feedback, whatever, then contact us on digileaders at webmail.sis.edu.hk. Thanks for listening, everyone.